I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Mark, chapter 11. We want to be reading verses 12 through 25 this morning. As Philip mentioned, we are uh, continuing to walk through a series on the last days of Christ, and we are taking particular events in that last week. We can't cover all of the last week because that's basically a third of the Gospels. So much happened or so much was recorded uh, in, in that last week of Christ before his crucifixion. Uh, but we're continuing to walk through this. And uh, this morning we're going to read in verse 12 through 25 uh, several different, uh, three different kind of instances here. And, and so this in, is entitled Figs, Flocks, and Floating Mountains. And, uh, and you will understand as we read what that's all about. And then the subtitle is Escaping Empty Religion. And so we're going to talk about the signs of empty religion and how we can avoid them this morning. Would you stand now in honor and reverence for the reading of God's Word? Mark chapter 11, uh, beginning in verse 12. The next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, The scriptures declare... My temple will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning to how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. The next, that evening, Jesus and his disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. And I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins, too. Father God, we come to you and we pray now that as we have heard your word, Lord, that, uh, that you might take it and work it into our hearts and minds, that we might do as you say uh, in the Psalms, that we would hide your word in our heart, that we would not sin against you, uh, that we would meditate on your word day and night. And as we delve into your word, Father, that you would release uh, your power into our lives, the power of the resurrection that will enable us to live for you each and every day. God, we pray and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Figs, flocks, and floating mountains. The first instance we see here, the first episode or story, is Jesus walking along, and he was hungry. I love that the Bible includes details like that, because Jesus was uh, both fully God, and yet he had full human nature, and meant he got hungry just like the rest of us. And he decides to go over and see a tree. It's full and, and flowered, and hey, maybe there's some good figs on it. Now, the gospel writers tell us Jesus and everybody else knew it wasn't the season yet. The figs shouldn't be ready yet. But Jesus went over to check out anyway because he had an important lesson to teach his disciples. He goes over and he sees this tree that looks beautiful from a distance. It's, it's flowered. It's got leaves. Everything looks great. But when he gets up close, no figs there to eat. And he looks at this fig tree and he curses it. And he said, may you never bear another fig tree again. And all the Bible says right then is his disciples heard it. And I, I, I kind of wonder what they were thinking, don't you? I mean, they're kind of like, Jesus, 
wow, we've, we've seen him cast out demons. We've seen him heal people. Uh, we've never seen him curse a tree before. This is a little interesting, and, and it's not even the season. So why in the world is Jesus doing this? And so it, it doesn't sound like they say anything, which is unusual for at least Peter to not speak up and, and blurt something out. But they're all kind of like, hmm, we don't know about this. They just remember it. And then the next day comes after Jesus uh, has done his things the rest of the day. They've gone back to Bethany, and they're coming back into the city of Jerusalem. And there the Bible says it's withered from the roots up. That means the whole thing. It's not just some blight that's taking place out in the leaves, but the whole thing is dead and dying. And, and here comes Peter. And it's so funny. He's seen, remember, remember, he's seen Jesus raise the dead. He's seen Jesus heal people, cast out demons, feed the 5,000, all these things. But he's like, Wow, Jesus, that tree that you cursed is actually dead now. Can you believe it? And, and Jesus is, you know, he's, he has to explain to them what that's all about. Now, here's the thing. and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Jesus was making a point, though, for the disciples about why he did that. He wanted them to understand that it was not enough to just show all the outward signs of life, but that there should actually be fruit produced by a healthy, anything that's healthy, whether it be a tree, or more specifically, in this case, he was talking about the lives of his followers. I got to thinking today about all the, the things we have, and you know, I, I was used to fruit-bearing trees growing up. I've told you before when my family had a pecan orchard, we had persimmon trees, we had fig trees, we had skepanon vines, we had pear trees, we had a couple apple trees that never did very good. Uh, we had kumquats, we had all kind of things, and we had full garden, we had sugar cane. I know I'm making you hungry, I apologize for that, but we had all these good things, and you know, everything that, that, that grew, you know, produced something. I mean, even the live oaks, I mean, they did made their acorns, but you know, we had all kinds of trees, and they all produced something, right? And I got to thinking, you know, Jesus may not like all these Bradford pears that we've got around now, all these ornamental trees that, that we plant, and they're all flowery and look good, and most of us like them, but those of you with allergies hate them because they, they mess you up. But, you know, they look pretty, but they don't produce a thing. I didn't understand until a few years ago that, hey, that's actually better for for selling a house. People don't want to pick up fruit. They don't want that mess. They just want the show now. Well, Jesus said, I don't just want the show. I don't just want the flower. I want there to be fruit that produce, that is produced, and then the fruit drops to the ground, and a bird carries it somewhere else, and then this is not bad stuff like we heard about in the children's sermon where it's littering or whatever. This is that fruit drops to the ground, and another the tree springs up and it drops fruit and it produces and produces and multiplies and multiplies and jesus says if you want real real religion if you want real christianity the true stuff it's not about a bunch of show and this concerns me greatly because in our world and in our country we have gotten more and more about outward appearance Image is everything we all want to look good not just as individuals but as churches and, and Oftentimes, it is easy for Christians to get carried away about what they look like or what their church looks like or appears to be rather than what is actually being produced. What is the true fruit that is happening? And what is true fruit? Well, Paul tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, kindness, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, it's not going around big religious talk. It's actual Christ-like actions that are coming out. James tells us that true and pure religion is this, to look after widows and orphans. In other words, we're not a I'll scratch my, your back and you scratch mine kind of deal. We're a, you know what, you could never help me, but I'm going to help you anyway. We don't say that to them, but we look at people with eyes of love and compassion and how we can serve them and live for them rather than what can you do for me you those are the kind of things that the bible talks is real religion it's not that you have a, a big heavy black bible it's not that you dress up for church you know and it, it's not uh any of those outward signs now now we're concerned about this stuff sometimes aren't we 
I, I won't say who because I have two daughters. But one of my daughters recently, we were going, going out to eat. And they had already got home and changed into their regular clothes out of their church clothes. And they said, I don't know if I want to go out because everyone will think that I didn't go to church. And I said, I'll change into jeans and a sweatshirt so they can think that about both of us, right? Okay, so then we went on out to eat. But we are sometimes concerned about how people look at us, right? And, and that's just a silly example, but I'm talking about, you and I both know there are people, and in fact, if we're, if we're honest, sometimes even us, we can get real concerned about what people think of us rather than what God thinks of us. Because God is looking at us, and he is saying, is there real fruit being produced in your life? Are there real Christ-like actions, love and sacrifice and compassion and sharing my gospel and my good news with a world that desperately needs it? So the lesson of the figs tells us we don't want to be all show and no go. We don't want to be ornamental trees, but we need to be those who bear true fruit. <clears throat> the second story is the story of Jesus clearing out the temple. He goes in and, and each of the gospels gives different details and this one doesn't give us so this one doesn't give us all the details, but we know he goes in there. He has a whip. I mean I just picture Indiana Jones, right? If Jesus just had that hat, it'd just be like Indiana Jones. He has a whip, he's driving people out, he says, get out of here with all this. And, and he says, you people you, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations, and you've made it into a den of robbers. Now, did Jesus wake up on the wrong side of the bed? I mean, he's already cursed a fig tree, and then he kind of goes crazy a little bit in the temple. What's wrong with Jesus? What's going on with him? Well, Jesus is frustrated by a religious system that values money over ministry. And I'm going to tell you, that is very, very, very... Uh, prevalent in our world today. I know of so many churches that everything, all of a sudden we start to build this machine, and some of it's debts, and some of it's high price salaries, and big important this and that and the other, and before you know it, instead of valuing ministry, actual touching people, everything, this has become a corporation. I'll tell you, over the years as a pastor, I've had different people um, say different things to me, you know, and, and they all, people view me different ways. So some people I'm pastor, some people I'm preacher, some people I'm Tim, uh, you know, some people I'm words I can't say. You, you know, there's all sorts of things that people can view me as, and, and, and I've had some people, you know, kind of say, hey, you're, you're the hired gun, you're here to preach, and that's about it. Don't, don't try to tell us what to do or lead us. But I've had other people come up to me and, and say, and, you know, I don't love that, but also it scares me. I've had people come up to me and say, hey, Tim, you're the CEO. What, whatever, whatever you say goes. Now, that's troublesome to me because I believe the Bible never puts one man or one woman in charge of everything. There's a system of shared leadership. That's why we have uh, elders and yes, in churches, there's a, there's a lead elder or a pastor or whatever, but it's never a one-man show. But it also bothers me when they say, well, you're the CEO, because that likens our organization to a business. And we're really less like an organization and more like an organism. We are the body. We are the living, breathing body of Christ. The church is not a business. Money is not the bottom line. God's will is the bottom line. Whatever we do should be about his will. So why was Jesus so upset? If you look at the ancient temple, there was a huge temple mound where this whole area was, but then the temple itself, the temple proper, was divided up into certain sections, and there was, there was the court of Gentiles that anybody, including Gentiles, could, could go into, and, and then there was the court of women, and there was the court of men, and then there was the places that the, only the priests could go, and, you know, of course, the Holy of Holies that only the high priests could go in. And we don't have time in this sermon to explain why they had all those particular sections, but let's just go back to this. This one section where everybody could go, everybody could worship, and for Gentiles, those who are not Jews, this was the only part of the temple that they could worship in. Can you imagine they are there to pray, they are there to give, they are there to sacrifice, and you hear someone calling out, hey, two, two doves for the price of one, come here, I got the best prices on doves. 
I'm a money changer. Come here, come here, change, change your money. See, they'd come from foreign lands, and, and they didn't have the right kind of money that was needed for the temple tax. And they were like, come on. Can you imagine trying to worship? And not only that, the Bible says that there are people passing through the marketplace. They were using the church as a shortcut. It's, just like, it's like if somebody who lived in that neighborhood back there just, just walked right through our service right now, walked on out the door. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just passing through. I, this is a shortcut to my house. And so this place, and Jesus said, look, God said in the Old Testament that my house will be a, prayer, a, a place of prayer for the nations. That is the Gentiles. That is everyone should be able to come and to worship. But money had taken such a hold, not that they couldn't have sold it outside, but they said, hey, it's even better. We'll just set up in the court of Gentiles. Who are they? They're not Jews. They don't deserve much. We'll sell doves, sheep. We'll do money changing. We'll do all sorts of business right here because it's most, most convenient and makes the most money for us. And these Gentiles will just have to deal with it. And Jesus didn't just wake up on the wrong side of the bed. He wasn't just a little salty that day. Jesus was enraged because these people had taken away the ability for these Gentiles, these who were far from God and yet trying to get close to God, they were blocking the way for them to be able to worship. And they had begun to value money over ministry. And so all of us in our lives, whether it's you and your personal household, and what you choose to do for a living and how many hours you choose to work and the type of work you take, you have to ask yourself the question, what's most important to be, money or ministry? Do we all have to have money? Yes, but what, what Jesus say? Man does not live on bread alone. The idea is that all of us ultimately, while we do have to provide for our families, we need to be looking at God's kingdom. And we as a church must always keep the priority of what is the ministry that God wants for us rather than how's the money doing. Do we have to check and be good stewards? Absolutely. We need to watch that. That's part of God's plan for us. But money can never take the place of ministry as our focus as a church. So there's the fig tree incident. <coughs> and then, then there is the money changing and all that uh, there in the, um, in the temple. So the figs, the flocks, and then we come to the floating mountains. Remember what I said? Peter was so excited. Jesus, this thing actually happened. It actually died. And again, we're thinking, really? Are you that surprised, Peter? He just raised Lazarus from the dead. He's fed the 5,000s. He's told the sea, calm and be still, and it did. And, and yet, they're still surprised, and we're that way too. Have you ever had it where you prayed for God to do a miracle, and then when he does, you're stunned? Wow, God actually answered the prayer. He actually did what I asked him to do. So often, our faith can be so weak. And he says to Peter, when Peter says, wow, this fig tree, that fig tree's nothing. That's small potatoes, Peter. You see this mountain here? If you look at this and you truly believe, go and lift yourself and put yourself float in the air and drop in the ocean, it'll be done. Fig trees are nothing. Now, this is an interesting verse for us, and it can easily be misunderstood. I remember as a child growing up in Biloxi, reading this verse, hearing about this verse in church, and I said, wow, moving mountains. Well, I looked all around. There, there were no mountains. Everything was flat as far as I could see where I lived in Biloxi. No, and I said, God, I want a mountain. Would you please bring a mountain and, and drop it here in my backyard? I mean, by the way, we we're so flat. It was so flat there when I was in high school cross country to practice hills, you know, for courses that would have hills. We had none in Biloxi. We had to ride up the ramp to the interstate, okay, up and down that ramp off the highway. That was the only hills that we could get. That's how flat it was. And now, so as a kid, I said, God, I want a mountain. I re and I looked, no mountain. God, I really, really want a mountain. No mountain. <sighs> I don't know why this doesn't work. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but this just doesn't work. 
Well, when we come to understand God's word, it's talking about faith in God and what he wants us to do. I don't know that there's ever actually a recorded scripture of a mountain being moved anywhere. Maybe there is, and you tell me after the service if I've missed one. Maybe back in the Old Testament somebody moved a mountain. I, I don't remember. But here's the thing. If God's will was for a mountain to be moved, and he put that on the heart of a Christian, and they prayed it, then God would do it. Just like God doesn't want us to go around to hunt fig trees and say, you sorry fig tree, you're not feeding me, curse you. No, that's not what God's plan for us, and neither is, his, is it for the mountain. But God was saying through his son Jesus, look, the mountains, and we always think those, those mountains, they're the highest and they're the biggest thing we can imagine. in this heavily mountainous area there in Israel, it's like, here's the biggest thing. You think this is a big deal, this fig tree. The biggest thing, the biggest obstacle or barrier that you ever have to climb in your life, guess what? If God says you're going to go through it, if God says that, that you're going to move it out of the way, all you have to do is you believe and trust, and it's taken care of. It's happening. The idea here is Jesus said, you know what? Don't be double-minded. James talks a lot about this, about people who kind of sort of believe and, and kind of sort of don't believe, and, and they come to church, and, you know, basically they want blessings, but they don't really believe. They kind of hope God does great things for them, but they're not really sure if they're all in on this Christianity thing. And God is saying to them, listen, you have to make up your mind. You have to decide. It doesn't mean that you lie to yourself and make yourself believe. You have to decide, do I believe God or not? Am I going to live my life for him or not? Am I going to always have some unanswered questions and some things that I wonder about? Absolutely, everybody does. There's no Christian out there. It doesn't matter if, if they have a Ph.D. in religion from five different schools. There's no Christian out there that says, I know it all, or, or, or if they're, they're honestly, they can't honestly say that. We all have questions and fears and doubts in this life, and yet if we, ha we make a choice that even with those things, we believe and we're going to stick to our belief. This is not, quote, blind faith, as in there's nothing to back it up. You can look at all sorts of things about the, uh, the evidence of Jesus Christ's resurrection. And there are so many things that are corroborated in, in history and archaeology from the Bible. But the point is, you're never going to have someone who can walk up to you and say, I can absolutely prove that you need to be a Christian. No one can force anyone to believe. You have to listen to the story of Jesus and choose this is what I'm going to stake my life on. It's not about kind of associating with religion so you can get blessings, but it's about believing wholeheartedly. Coming to God when we even we doubt and asking him to help us to believe more. I always love the story of the man who told Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus answered his prayer. Because God understood what he was saying. God, I do have fears and doubts, but I know that, that you're greater than those. And God, I believe. And the final thing is the second part of this moving mountains, floating mountains thing here. Let me, wrap, let me wrap these up and sum these up. These signs of empty religion that we need to avoid. The first one is all show and no go. Or, or ornamental religion. We want to avoid that type of thing. We want to avoid valuing money over ministry. We want to avoid seeking blessings over pure belief. And finally, we want to avoid hypocrisy concerning forgiveness. This is one of the toughest things for all of us as Christians. Jesus talks here about prayer, but then he goes and backs it up a little bit further. He says in verse 24, I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. The idea is, as long as you are, and I are holding grudges, 
anger, bitterness, unforgiveness in our hearts against other people, whoever they may be, family or friends or loved ones or ones you don't love at all. If you're holding a grudge against someone, Jesus said, you know how high your prayers are getting? Not further than the ceiling. They're not reaching me. These, these prayers will not be answered. I don't care how much faith you say you have. Because as you are unforgiving, you're being an absolute hypocrite about forgiveness. What do I mean a hypocrite about forgiveness? We're a hypocrite about forgiveness when we say, God, you're a God of mercy and grace and love, and you picked me up despite all my brokenness, despite all of my doubts and my fears and my messiness, and you forgave me. God, I love you so much. Thank you for that amazing grace. And yet when others have harmed us, we said, no grace for you. Remember the soup Nazi on Seinfeld? Well, we're kind of the grace Nazi. No grace for you. You've done bad enough things. You hurt me. Even worse, you, you hurt my child or you hurt someone that I love. And so maybe I'd forgive you if you had just hurt me, but you hurt them, and I'm not going to forgive you. And while we take in all of God's grace freely, we withhold it to those who are in need of it. And God says, there's not a thing that's going to be done for your prayer as long as you are burdened down by that, in, uh, holding in that bitterness and unforgiveness towards others. And that will ruin, by the way, any relationship. The child and parent, spouses, whatever. But here's the thing. A lot of us get that, but a lot of us say, you know, I don't care about that relationship. Guess what? Unforgiveness does not only harm your relationship with that one person that you are not forgiving. Unforgiveness is a, it is a poison that no matter how much you try to contain it in this little jar that has you and this one person you won't forgive, it, the acid of unforgiveness is so strong that it burns through and it melts through, and this poison seeps into every area of your life. And you think, I love all these people, but I hate this one. I'm not forgiving them, and it's okay. And the reality is that all of your relationships, and most importantly, your relationship with God becomes completely tainted by unforgiveness. Don't, don't be that person who does everything else, who comes to church and reads their Bible and prays to God and gives to people and loves on people, but you ruin it all. You destroy it all by being unforgiven, unforgiving towards that person or those people that hurt you. Because God says no matter how much of this other stuff you do, if you're holding on to this, guess what? Your prayers are going nowhere. And your life is being held down by unforgiveness. How do we become, how do we escape empty religion? How do we become a person that really makes a difference? Not just flowers, but real fruit. I went this, uh, this past Thursday to the funeral of uh, my next door neighbor growing up, Bob Goolsby. Now, I saw Bob lots of places. Uh, when I was going over to see his kid, visit with one of his kids, he had a daughter of my age, a son that was a couple years younger, and uh, we'd go over to visit. I might see him wave. I would see him at church, the church at least that I went to. I started going to his church eventually in high school, and uh, so I might shake his hand there. And then he was the head of what was called pupil accounting in our high school. So uh, unlike a lot of coaches, you know, who did driver's ed or, or did the geography or whatever, he was the head of all the attendance stuff. And so everybody who came in late, everybody who had to check in or check out or any of that, you had to come through Bob Goolsby uh, at pupil accounting. And so on those occasions, I'd kind of be sneaking by <laughs> as best as I could when, when I was running a little bit late. So I saw Mr. Goolsby all over. I saw him all over the place. And, and if you look at him and you glanced at him, you know, you might, you might not think he was all that much of a Christian. I mean, he kind of had this little tough guy act going on. You know, you, 
kind of had to do that with the students. And, uh, you know, they, they need to be afraid of that tardy. It, it wouldn't really do much if they walked in, oh, it's okay that you're late. No, 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 no. Uh, you didn't get that with him. So he kind of had that tough guy thing. Uh, he, he was kind of gristled. Uh, lifelong, lifelong smoker, and just, he was one of those tough co- coaches, and, you know, might have, might have said a few words out there on the field that he shouldn't have, and um, you don't have to do that, by the way. I, I know a couple of state championship coaches that never cuss their kids. They might raise their voice, but that don't ever do it. So if you're a coach, don't ever think you have to do that. But, you know, he might have done that a little bit here and there. And, and so you might have looked at some of these things and said, well, I don't know about this guy. But, but let me tell you a little bit more about Bob if you get to know him. He, he was imperfect like all of us. But Bob kept a Bible there right under the desk of pupil accounting. And he'd have some, some verses underlined. And someone come in late and they didn't know what to expect because Bob, remember, he had that stern demeanor. Bob might pull out that Bible and say, read that verse right there for me. And they'd read that verse, and he'd, okay, that's what you need to do. Or that's what you need to know for today. Or he had a box right there in people accounting. And people coming in and coming out, and the box said, great reading material, free. And he'd even tell people, hey, you might want to check that out. That's, that's good stuff in there. It didn't say what was on the box, but they'd open up the box. And there was a pile of Gideon New Testaments. I don't know that Bob was a Gideon himself, but he got those that were sent to the school, and, and, and he, would, he would, you know, just give them out all he could. But somewhere along the line, I think it was maybe at an FCA meeting or something, somebody looked at him and said, Bob, you can make more of a difference in these kids' lives than anybody else could imagine because you're there with them on a daily basis. And so he began to go, and he'd give talks to the football team. And when there was kids that were troubled at school, he said, give them to me. Give me the worst ones, the ones who were acting up and who were acting out. Send them to me, and I'll talk to them. And he'd sit down, and he'd open up that Bible, and he might give them one of those New Testaments. There was a lady at his funeral who stood up, and she gave a eulogy. She said she began to work with him there in 1988. In pupil accounting, she said, here I was, a young Catholic girl, and uh, he was this Baptist, and I, I saw him open up the Bible and share a verse. She said, I looked at him after the student walked off and said, Bob, can you do that? He said, I just did. And that was Bob's way. He said, hey, I'm here to impact people for Jesus Christ. It wasn't a showy thing. It wasn't to talk about a big, being a big Christian. He even seemed a little gruff sometimes. Bob is just one of many people, and I'm convinced the people with the greatest rewards in heaven are not going to be the megachurch pastors, the famous authors, the people we all know about. I'm convinced they are people, men and women, boys and girls, who in their ordinary, everyday life choose to let their light shine. They're not about the showy stuff, about the fake stuff. They're about being authentic, even within their imperfections, reaching out and loving people in the name of Jesus Christ. And I believe that is a picture of what Jesus looks for. And he looks at our lives and he says, yes, there's fruit, there's fruit, there's fruit. And so when we stand before him one day, he'll say, well done. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, God, I come to you and I ask for your forgiveness for myself and for all of us when we get caught up in appearances, when we get caught up in the trivial things of this life, and we forget about our main job here on this life is to live lives that honor you, not through putting on a show, but through living out the reality of the salvation and the gospel that you've given us. God, help us to produce true fruit that honors you in our lives. Bless this time now that we have of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.